Good afternoon, wherever you are. Welcome again to Mr. Shipman's class. We are in our fourth series of the state of education. Today, we're doing social studies. Now, before I begin this, please let me make sure you can reach me on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google+, which will be ended in April, and, of course, www.terrenshipman.com. And you can listen to us all over the world. I'm here today with two excellent social studies teachers. Gentlemen, please introduce yourselves. My name is uh, Ken Hill. I've been doing social studies now for about 17 years uh, and really enjoy doing what I do with the kids. My name is Ron Mack. I've been doing uh, social studies here at Memorial Middle School for this is my eighth year. I, am on, uh, I teach seventh grade. I'm on the STEM team and um, I love it. All right, gentlemen, great to have you both here today. And of course, I'm Dr. Terrence Shipman. This is 25 years of teaching. I've been teaching a whole lot of subjects. So let's break it down. The first question, what is the state of social studies today? Where, did, where are we when it goes to teaching our young children about social studies? It, it all depends on, on how you want to look at it. Um, if you're looking at it from uh, the point of view of, uh, of curriculum and, and, and a state driven um, is, is pretty dry. However, if you uh, are a little venturous with what you do inside your classroom, it can become quite interesting. Uh, but my personal uh, feeling right now with the state of our society is that we're not taking enough time to teach civics. And uh, with us not teaching civics, we have a bunch of people walking out into society who don't even uh, really understand even their basic rights. Nonetheless, uh, you know, any other rights such as voting and, and the importance of such uh, and things of that nature. Um, as far as my opinion, as far as the status of social studies, is um, I can speak on it from a, a perspective here in Georgia because I haven't taught social studies anywhere else, but uh, pretty much here in Georgia. Um, as far as uh, the standards, I think they give us leeway. Um, let me speak first about uh, seventh grade social studies. In seventh grade social studies, we study uh, the Middle East, we study Africa, and now we're into Southern and Eastern Asia. Um, I like teaching seventh grade social studies specifically um, because in those three regions that I just mentioned of the world, there's always something going on. There are hot spots. Um, it's always something going on in the Middle East. So uh, I like the fact that we could make it real world. That's how I try to uh, uh, set up my class. Uh, yes, I'll teach them the standards. Yes, I'll teach them the vocabulary and all the concepts and things that uh, they, they need to learn as far as to master the standard. But when we could take that information outside of the walls here at Memorial uh, Middle School, um, that's where I get the, uh, my most joy. Um, I don't like all the uh, conflicts and the atrocities that go on in different places of the world, like Africa, for example. Uh, but I do like the fact that uh, uh, we could uh, bring those uh, those things into the classroom, and they're actually current events. They're actually real-world situations. So um, from that perspective, um, I feel that social studies is in a good place. Uh, for me, teaching social studies, uh, having taught social studies on the elementary and the middle school level, I think the connection needs to be, as I always try to do every year, I try to get students to know about themselves. I think at the beginning of every year, I always had the students do a family tree. If they get to know themselves or, and get to know the city 
and the state with they, that they live in. I take like the first two, three weeks to build this background, to build this relationship with them. Because I want to make sure, before we start studying all the other parts of the world, I think you need to know who you are. Well, so that I can relate other parts of the world to what's going on right here in your own backyard. All right, gentlemen, great answers for the first question. Now for the second question. Where do we need to go with teaching social studies? Where do we need to go? Well, you know, e even though we have uh, right now technology in the classroom, you're still pretty much limited to uh, the genre that you're teaching in. I think if we had uh, better resources online to have field trip type experiences to share with the kids uh, with things around the world, um, it, it might open up a few eyes. But at the same time, as, the, as you gentlemen already mentioned, you have to make this real to the kids. Um, and a lot of them, they don't make the connection between us being in a global society where everyone's interconnected. As I often tell the kids, there's, you know, as long as you got the money, you can buy about 90 percent of what the world has to offer. The other 10 percent, you don't have any business owning anyway. Um, but they don't understand that uh, what they have in their lives other kids around the world have the same stuff as well. So, you know, although we think we're Americans and we're so special, in the reality, in a global society, we're not that special at all. We're, we're just more consumers out there like the rest of the world. Uh, I believe that social studies, um, as far as my perspective, is in a good place. Um, here in Rockdale County, we do have one-to-one -one um, devices. Every student has their own uh, laptop, so they have access to the um, internet. I believe to uh, to improve upon where we are, I believe as teachers, as educators, we have to do more in um, guiding our children, our students, to compare and contrast the different regions of the world that we study, to compare and contrast, for example, life in the United States as opposed to life in somewhere in the Middle East, such as uh, Afghanistan or Israel or Syria. Um, um, I also believe that it should be through the social studies classes, uh, we should take the lead on showing the students that there is competition in the world today. Uh, like Mr. Hill was saying, we're in a global society and um, um, what we're doing here in the United States as far as educating our youth, um, they're doing the same thing or even better over in India. And so, um, um, uh, it's, 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 it's just not that, Mr. Mack. It's the competition for jobs that they don't understand. Yes, yes. When you have someone as uh, just as qualified or more qualified over in India, where a company can pay them less than what they pay you over here in America, they're going to move that job over to America. And I don't think that our children understand, our students don't understand, that with this the, the globalization of the world is that some of their jobs are not even being offered to them because the companies know that there is maybe someone better educated across the globe over there. Some of our kids need to learn how to be multilingual uh, to compete in today's True. jobs. True. And, and they're just not seeing this. I think, like I said, they're too consumer-based. They, 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 our, our children are hooked on consumerism instead of uh, the opposite way, being a producer. And we need True. to teach our children more about being producers to sell something to the world than to always keep trying to buy something from the world. That's, that's correct. And I'm going to, even before, uh, excellent point by um, uh, my colleague, Mr. Hill, but I'm going to uh, take that a step further. Even before they get into the work, uh, the workforce, um, they have competition uh, because students um, from the United States are not necessarily going over to India to go to college or to go to the universities. They're not necessarily going over to universities in Africa, in it Kenya. Uh, they're not necessarily going over there because we have some of the best um, universities uh, in the whole world. But the point is, in a global society, um, 
our students are vying for spots or admissions into those universities um, with, in competition with students from China, students from India, uh, students from Africa. And so um, we have to um, take the lead. Social studies has to take the lead in helping our students and, uh, to understand that we are in a global society and their competition uh, for uh, spots in the universities, university admissions to schools, the uh, high ranking schools like Georgia Tech and, and, and schools like that. Um, there's competition. You got foreigners that, that want to get into those universities just um, as our students do. So uh, social studies, we need to take more of a lead in uh, uh, helping our students to realize we are in a global society and there is mad competition out there but even even before that what if what about the the, the student that's not going to go to college we're true. not even teaching them how to balance a checkbook true and, mm -hmm. and and if they don't understand basic financial literacy when they get out here into the real world these people will eat them up when it comes to interest rates when it comes to finances when when, when anything money wise They'll be eaten up in society because they don't have the basic financial literacy to understand what they're doing with their with, with the unfortunately with the little money that they may be making. True. I think one of the things I would like to see social studies go. Um, it's nice that we learn about all the different regions in the world in the middle school level. I think I wish in middle school level that maybe sixth grade. They learn about themselves. We teach, uh, goes back to what you were saying earlier, Mr. Hill, civics. Go back to how you vote. Uh, every year I do something in my class. Uh, I ask the students, if your parents go vote, bring me the sticker, you'll get extra credit. They don't even understand why we have this whole voting process or how to go to the polls. How do you place your ballot? How do you get your little ticket, your little yellow ticket, put it in the machine, it comes back to you, did the man give you a sticker? They don't understand none of that. I've taken my kids since they was even in a stroller. They've grown up with the, seeing how to vote. Most of these kids have never been to vote. They don't know any of the processes. Okay, let me uh, piggyback off of what you said, uh, um, Doc, as far as uh, basic civics. That we need to teach our students, go back to teaching our students the basic civics, and not only that, to model it or to show them how it looks, meaning, just like you said, to take when, when adults or parents go to vote, take our kids with, uh, with us when we go and vote so they could see, so we could model that process um, in front of them. Uh, let me tell you, uh, I've run into several, or I've had several uh, students from whose parents were from India or China or Vietnam. And it seems like those students know more about our country and things like how to vote than those students who were born in this country. That's because I believe those students that come from parents that were not born in this country or uh, students that come from other countries um, to this country to study to study and to live, um, they appreciate it. Uh, they appreciate it more. Um, and I don't want to get into politics, but uh, a lot of our students are turned off with especially government because they see what's going on within our government. And um, I mean, you know, I could put a picture of, of uh, President Trump on the screen and you'll get all kind of negative reactions. And I've never ever seen that in my life, uh, whether as a student or as a teacher. Uh, we have to do better as parents and teachers um, to uh, help our students to appreciate living here in the United States. It's not perfect, but um, just appreciate being a citizen of the United States, and I don't think they do. All right, gentlemen, we're down to our final question for today. How can they come better prepared from elementary and home? How can we better prepare them? I think in a way we have answered that, but let's dig a little deeper. What can they do on the elementary level and at home to better prepare these kids for social studies? 
you know, even, even if it comes to something as simple as geography, I don't know the last time, and I used to teach elementary, but I don't remember the last time I even seen a globe in a classroom. Just, just something where a kid can imagine where a place is in the world, even before they go Googling it. They can just look at the world and see that it's a sphere, it's a circular object. They don't, they don't even think of it, uh, of that anymore. I, the, the, the basic map skills are not there anymore. Directional and cardinal and all, all of that, that type of stuff, that stuff is lacking. I think that needs to be taught. Before we start talking about different cultures around the world, let's get a grip on what's actually, where is what in the world. That's, that's what I would say. Uh, me, I think it goes back to reading, writing, reading critically, uh, writing uh, at a certain level. Uh, I, call, I tell my students uh, Mickey, Mickey Mouse words, uh, Mickey Mouse paragraphs, getting away from those types of uh, vocabulary words and th that type of writing and reading and having the students think and write more critically. Um, uh, having them read, for example, instead of reading the um, Rockdale Citizen, the, the local newspaper or the AJC, um, I have my students or I encourage them to read the New York Times, the New York Post, the Wall Street Journal, uh, because they cover um, worldwide events and the the writing and the reading is on a whole nother level. Are they going to know every word that they that they read no um, that's why they they have their laptops any word they don't know or they can get a dictionary um, but I believe it starts there with uh, reading and writing at a higher level and bringing in more real world um, examples and real world discussions at home at the dinner table and in the classroom um, parents um, when you get those, these kids at home over the dinner table, ask them what they learned about today. Ask them in social studies. We're talking about social studies. What did you learn in social studies today? Oh, we're learning about China or India. Tell me something about China or India. What's going on with China or India? What's the United States relationship with China um, um, at this point? Um, it's been in the news. Um, I'm big on current events. Trying to make real world connections. That's my goal as a as an educator. The bottom line. Trying to take the class outside of the four walls and um, uh, having real world discussions, um, real world examples, so on and so forth. Okay. Quickly, I'm gonna say one of the things I think from the elementary level and from a parenting level. Um, no, let your kids know their history. I've said it once before, if they know who they are, they can make such a big difference in this world. True. When you go around the city of Atlanta, talk about the history of Atlanta. True. Uh, talk about directions. Tell them that 285 goes around the whole city and you has got 75 and 85 cuts through the city. You have to let the students know where they are. This is your city. This is your history. All right, gentlemen, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you very no much problem. for this podcast. And as closing, I always say you can reach me on again on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Google Plus, and my website, www.terrenshipman.com. And in closing, as I always say, I am special, I am smart, I am somebody. Thank you very much for being in Mr. Shipman's class. Mr. Shipman's class, Mr. Shipman's class.